So good morning, everyone. Let me welcome you to the second session of this conference. It's titled Fiscal and Monetary Policy in Volatile Times. So we will uh, discuss the impact of government spending and taxation. And we have two excellent papers today, one by Luca Fornaro, uh, titled Fiscal Stimulus with Supply Constraints. And then the second paper will be by Vai Kui, um, uh, called Taxing Sudden Capital uh, Income Surges. So let us start uh, right away with the first paper, and I would give the floor to Luca, please. Okay, so first of all, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to present this paper. It's a pleasure to be here. Right, so uh, this paper is uh, motivated by the fact that the pandemic experience, uh, I think, challenged our understanding of inflation, or at least my understanding of inflation. Why? Because during the pandemic, we've been seeing a disconnect between prices and wages, especially the times when inflation was rising rapidly, wages did not rise nearly as much as prices. And this contrasts uh, a bit with the baseline New Keynesian model, because in the New Keynesian model, wages are really the prime driver of uh, uh, price inflation. So how to make progress? I think that one way, one promising way, is to think about how technological constraints affect uh, the way that firms set prices. Why do I think that this is a useful uh, way to make progress? Well, because there's been uh, two recent papers empirical papers, which have uh, two very interesting observations. So the first one is by Boehm and Pandala in IR, and uh, they look at how firms' price uh, setting depends on the level of capacity utilization. And what they document is very interesting. So they show that uh, firms that operate far below their maximum level of capacity tend to maintain uh, prices constant in the face of demand shock. On the other hand, if you look at firms uh, that are at a high level of capacity utilization, well, these firms uh, tend to increase prices by a large amount uh, when they're hit by increases in demand. So supply constraints seem to matter for uh, price setting. Moreover, there is another uh, recent paper by Ethan Ilzeski, which makes another interesting observation, which is that uh, firms tend to react to large demand shock by investing in order to relax their future supply constraint. So it looks like technological or supply constraint, they are not static, but they tend to evolve over time. And what I will do today is very simple, so I will show you a framework that embeds these two empirical insights and think a little bit about uh, the implication for inflation. So at the heart of the model, there will be occasionally binding supply constraints. Uh, you will see what they are more precisely when I show you the model, but just think about them as technological constraints that prevent firms from expanding output quickly. And the interesting uh, aspect of these uh, uh, supply constraint is that when they bind, they will generate uh, an endogenous markup of prices over wages. So they will create a disconnect between prices and wages. I will use the model to think about the impact of fiscal stimulus on inflation. Here, the motivation comes quite naturally from the debate about the inflationary consequences of the pandemic era's fiscal stimulus in the US. And in particular, I will show you um, the so-called fiscal Phillips multiplier. That is, I will ask myself, imagine that the government, through fiscal stimulus, want to generate a given increase in output. What is going to be the impact on the inflation rate? And both in the paper and in the presentation, the emphasis will be on a simple model useful to think about uh, analytic results. Uh, let me say that this is complementary to a recent strand of literature which looks at the relationship between inflation and supply constraints. So these other papers tend to take uh, a quantitative approach and provide rich frameworks. Here instead the focus is really on a simple model useful to uh, derive intuition. Okay, in terms of results, so the main theme of the paper is really that a fiscal stimulus tend to be highly inflationary when supply constraint binds. This is unsurprising because when firms are against their supply constraint, uh, they cannot react to an increase in demand caused by the fiscal stimulus by increasing output, so they will react by increasing prices instead. So we show you that, for instance, a large fiscal stimulus or a fiscal stimulus implemented in the context of supply disruption tend to be especially inflationary because these are the circumstances under which supply constraint tend to bind. Then I will turn to uh, a multi-sector economy and here I will show you two results. So first I will show you that uh, a fiscal stimulus has a particularly large impact on inflation if it is unbalanced. That is, if it is directed at some specific sector of the economy rather than being uh, road-based. And then I will show you that a fiscal stimulus, again, has a particularly large impact on inflation if it happens during times of sectoral reallocation, during times in which the private sector rebalances its expenditure across different sectors. And these two results, I think, are interesting to understand uh, the pandemic experience. 
Then I will introduce in the model uh, the possibility that firms might invest in order to relax their future supply constraint by upgrading their technology. And here the key insight will be that this uh, creates an intertemporal inflation trade-off. That is, a fiscal stimulus will generate an initial rise in inflation, but this rise in inflation will be transitory. Why? Because we'll first we react to the stimulus by investing, this will increase productivity in the medium run, and this will tend to generate inflation, contain inflationary pressures over the medium run. Okay, so let me show you uh, the framework. So the household side is super standard. So there is a representative household which gets utility from consumption. Uh, households save in one period nominal bonds. They get all the incomes from the economy, so the sum of uh, profits and labor income, and then they pay some taxes uh, to the government. Um, the optimal saving behavior gives us our usual Euler equation. For simplicity, I will assume that this household has some desired labor supply, which is constant and equal to a bar. But due to the presence of wage rigidities, actual employment might deviate from household desired labor supply. And to make things simple, I will assume that nominal wages are fully sticky. They are constant over time. Now, this assumption, of course, is not realistic, but it helps me to uh, highlight the new driver of inflation of this framework as opposed to frameworks in which wages are the main driver of price inflation. The firm side of the economy is where things get uh, more interesting. So there is a unit mass of competitive firms which to produce need to perform two tasks, A and B. So these firms need to allocate labor between these two tasks according to this uh, Cobb Douglas uh, production function. Here is where the technological or supply constraint kicks in, in that I assume that the amount of labor that uh, can be allocated to task B is subject to an upper bound. There is a limit on how much uh, labor can be allocated to task B. When this constraint binds, of course, this distorts uh, the allocation of labor between the two tasks and generates some efficiency losses, as you will see in a second. The variable Y bar, which for the moment I will take as an exogenous variable, plays uh, a very important role uh, in the framework because essentially determines whether supply constraints bind or not. When output is below Y bar, supply constraints do not bind. When output is above Y bar, supply constraints start binding and the allocation of labor is inefficient. So in general, the supply constraint will tend to bind when there is a big surge in demand, a big increase in demand for firm's product, but it can also bind when there is a shock that reduces Y bar. You can think about it as a shock that reduces access to some input complementary to labor in production, the supply disruption. What are the consequences of uh, uh, this binding supply constraint? So let me start by highlighting the consequences for output. So here is the aggregate production function. So output in this model is linear in labor if uh, the supply constraint does not bind, just like uh, your standard New Keynesian model, but it becomes concave in labor once constraints start binding. So here we are capturing you know, the idea that uh, if you try to increase output above the normal level fast, firms are going to run into productivity losses because it's just hard to expand production quickly uh, for firms. What is the implication from prices? So here we are in a competitive economy, so in equilibrium prices have to be equal to marginal production cost. So when supply constraints do not bind, prices are just equal to wages. They track the wage rate. But when supply constraints start binding, prices disconnect from wages and become increasing in quantity produced. Why? Because when supply constraints start binding, again, uh, labor productivity declines, and you need to compensate firms for this decline in productivity by giving them a higher price. So you see that a binding supply constraint in this model acts as a sort of endogenous markup of prices over wages and disconnect partly prices uh, from wages. I can show you the same result uh, graphically. This is a graph that I will use on and on during my presentation. Uh, so here you have prices uh, on the vertical axis and output on the horizontal one. Uh, this is a supply curve. So the supply curve is flat when the, uh, the supply constraint do not bind for value of output below Y bar, and it becomes increasing once uh, supply constraints start binding. And it's consistent with the kind of evidence provided by Berman, Pandara, and Ayar, who showed that at the sectoral level, uh, supply curves have this convex form. Since uh, in this simple model all the firms are identical, uh, this kind of supply curve translates uh, into an identical aggregate Phillips curve. So this model features uh, this kind of nonlinear aggregate Phillips curve. As I will show you, one interesting feature of the model is that uh, the Phillips curve is far from stable, tend to move around uh, following macroeconomic shock or policy intervention. For instance, if you think about uh, a shock uh, 
that lowers Y bar, that tightens the supply constraint, which could be a supply disruption that reduces access to intermediate inputs. Well, graphically, this looks like a leftward shift of the steep portion of the Phillips curve. So shocks to the supply constraint move around the steep portion of the supply curve. The rest of the model is very simple. So uh, the fiscal authority just set a path for government consumption and uh, finances it with lump sum taxes. So literally, you can take this government consumption as uh, government purchases. With a bit of imagination, you can also think about this government consumption as transfer to hand-to-mouth households, which are directly used to this, for this household to finance consumption. Um, monetary policy takes a very simple form. So I will assume throughout uh, this talk that monetary policy holds uh, the real interest rate constant. This implies uh, that private consumption is constant as well and always equal to the steady state value. I make this choice because it is well understood that monetary policy affects uh, the private consumption response uh, to changes in government expenditure and so the fiscal multiplier. Here I want to simplify on this front in order to focus uh, on the impact of fiscal stimulus on inflation. And then in this simple model, output is uh, totally consumed. And even though that's not very important, I will assume that in steady state, supply constraint do not bind and household work uh, their desired amount of labor. All right, let me show you uh, some, uh, some result. So as I said here, uh, the fiscal multiplier is trivial. So since private consumption does not react to changes in government expenditure, output moves one for one with public expenditure. So there is nothing interesting here. The interesting part comes when we start thinking about the fiscal Phillips multiplier. When we start thinking about what is the impact of inflation of a fiscal stimulus which moves output by 1%. So the first result here is that uh, this fiscal Phillips multiplier is state dependent. So prices do not react to a fiscal stimulus if supply constraints do not bind, while uh, they increase after a fiscal stimulus if uh, supply constraints are binding. By how much do prices increase? This is captured by the parameter alpha, which is capturing the importance of uh, uh, the task B, of the task which is subject to supply constraint in production. Uh, what do empirical estimates suggest about uh, the value of this parameter alpha? Of course, it's hard to give a precise number, but if I draw on, again, the evidence by Bohm and Pandaline IR, well, they show that uh, if you look at firms uh, uh, which are far below their maximum level of capacity utilization, prices do not react to changes in quantity produced. While if you look at uh, uh, firms that are close to full capacity, well, the elasticity of prices to quantity produces is 0.6. So this kind of evidence suggests that uh, supply constraint and capacity constraint have a strong impact on firms' pricing behavior. So we should take uh, this kind of uh, channel seriously. A result that follows pretty immediately from uh, this insight is that in this model, the size of the fiscal stimulus matters. Intuitively, because it takes a large fiscal stimulus to make supply constraint bind. So for instance, if you look at a small stimulus which moves the economy from point A to point B, uh, well, this will not be inflationary because a small fiscal stimulus doesn't push firm against uh, their supply constraint. But if you look at a large fiscal stimulus, for instance, moving the economy from A to C, that's when supply constraints start binding, and that's when you start seeing inflationary pressure. So this result suggests that you know, local fiscal multiplier, or looking at the local impact of a fiscal stimulus of, on inflation, may not be very informative about the impact of large fiscal stimulus probe. A second result is that uh, a fiscal stimulus is more likely to generate uh, a rise in inflation if it happens in the context of supply disruption. Why? Because supply disruption shifts the kink part, the upper low part of the Phillips curve toward the left. So, you know, while a fiscal stimulus in normal time will move the economy from point A to point B, not generate inflationary pressure, a fiscal stimulus in times of supply disruption, which moves the economy from point A to point C, might generate a big rise in inflation. So the context in which a fiscal stimulus takes place is important to understand its consequences for inflation. Now, two remarks. One I already mentioned, but it's worth repeating. So here, binding supply constraint acts as markup shock of prices over wages. Why? Because when supply constraint bind, wages do not reflect marginal production cost, because you have lower productivity coming from the supply constraint. And this is really the key difference between this framework and the baseline New Keynesian model, in which instead wages matter a lot for pricing decision. 
And also the difference with respect to a strand of model which look at economies with a nonlinear Phillips curve, in which the Phillips curve is nonlinear because of downward wage rigidities. Here, the nonlinearity is not due to downward wage rigidities, it's really due to the fact that technological factors partly disconnect prices from wages. The second remark uh, that I would like uh, to make uh, is that uh, supply constraints uh, might tell us something about uh, the inflationary consequences of uh, the recent US pandemic fiscal stimulus, and especially of the fact that uh, this corresponded to a rise in prices for uh, given wages. Moreover, if you think about the fact that the US fiscal stimulus was large and it was accompanied by pandemic disruption, well, the model tells you that you should expect a high fiscal multiplier. So perhaps you know, we should explore the role of supply constraint to understand the inflationary consequences of uh, the recent fiscal stimulus. OK, so now let me turn to a multi-sector economy. Why do I want to do that? Well, because another interesting feature of uh, the recent fiscal stimulus is that uh, it happened in the context of a rebalancing of expenditure out of services and toward manufactured goods. Uh, in fact, I would say that there is reason to think that the fiscal stimulus itself contributed to this rebalancing of expenditure because this peak in the share of expenditure on goods really corresponded with Biden's fiscal stimulus. So fiscal policy might uh, have contributed to this change in consumption pattern as well. So let's think about the implication for, for inflation. So to make things simple, let me assume that there are just two sectors, manufacturing and services, and that households aggregate the goods produced by these two sectors according to this uh, Cobb Douglas utility function. Uh, the parameter omega captures the share of expenditure on goods. And uh, well, the CPI, the consumer price index, is just a weighted average of the two prices where the weight is given by this parameter omega. Um, let me assume that uh, supply constraints are sector specific, and in particular, they are proportional to the long run expenditure share. Essentially, I'm looking at an economy in which technology is shaped by the long run consumption pattern. Fiscal policy now is defined as a path for government expenditure on the two goods, so manufacturing and services. And let me define uh, uh, real government expenditure just as the nominal expenditure deflated by the CPI. Okay, the first result that I want to show you is what happens when uh, the fiscal stimulus is unbalanced, when it targets a particular sector. To do so, let me suppose that private expenditure is stable. So that the private sector has constant expenditure share. If the government had the same expenditure share as the private sector, the model would collapse to the baseline one and we will not have anything interesting going on. So let me deviate from that. And let me assume that the fiscal stimulus fully targets manufacturing. So here what the government is doing is that it's keeping real expenditure on services constant and it's administering stimulus by increasing expenditure on manufacturing. So I can show you the result just by looking at this diagram. So the blue line is the baseline economy that I showed you before, balanced fiscal stimulus. The red line is the case of an unbalanced fiscal stimulus. And you can see that this unbalanced fiscal stimulus tend to shift the Phillips curve toward the left. So that for a given amount of GDP, you have a higher inflation rate. And the intuition is pretty straightforward. So here, fiscal stimulus is cramming a lot of demand on a few firms. So it makes it more likely that uh, the supply constraint becomes binding for the firms targeted by the stimulus, and this firm will react through an increase in prices. Uh, instead, the other firms in the economy, the ones that are not targeted by the stimulus, will not cut prices because they are on the flat portion of the Phillips curve. So here, an unbalanced fiscal stimulus tends to be more inflationary than the balanced one because it generates inflation in the targeted sector, but does not generate a decrease in prices in the rest of the economy. And I think that this result is interesting because uh, there is a lit literature suggesting that the composition of fiscal stimulus matters. For instance, there is a very nice paper by Cox and co-author where they show that, um, in practice, fiscal stimulus is typically targeted some specific sector. So empirically, fiscal stimulus are typically unbalanced. They also have a very nice framework in which they highlight that structural differences in sectoral price stickiness um, met, uh, mean that the composition of fiscal stimulus matter. This paper has a similar feeling, but here uh, the difference is that price stickiness is endogenous. So in this model, there is no structural difference in price stickiness across sector. Uh, the difference in price stickiness arises endogenous, endogenously because of supply constraint, and it depends on uh, the fiscal policy itself. 
Another result that I want to highlight for this multi-sector economy is what happens when uh, fiscal stimulus is administered in an economy which is unbalanced. So an economy that is experiencing a sectoral allocation of uh, uh, expenditure. So to do so transparently, let me assume that the government has the same expenditure shares as the private sector. But now let's think about a case in which uh, there is a temporary rise in the expenditure share of manufacturing, a temporary rise in Omega, what you can think of as a reallocation shock. What will happen? So, you know, the result is very similar to what I showed you before. This reallocation shock moves the Phillips curve toward the left or the upper slope part of the Phillips curve toward the left. Why? Well, because now you are forcing a lot of demand on uh, one particular sector of the economy. This sector is not prepared to receive uh, this high demand because its technological constraints are shaped by the long-run consumption pattern. And this generates high inflation in the sector with high demand, which is not compensated by low inflation in the other sector because the other sector is uh, on the flat part of the Phillips curve. What happens if uh, you do fiscal stimulus in this kind of economy? Well, this is likely to generate high inflationary pressure because it exacerbates this uh, unbalanced uh, consumption pattern. And in fact, you know, this result uh, is connected to uh, a recent literature which shows that uh, reallocation shocks, sudden changes in the allocation of consumption across different sectors tend to worsen the inflation output trade-off. So they tend to shift uh, the Phillips curve in an adverse direction. Uh, here, what we're adding on top is that in this context, a fiscal stimulus uh, tend to be particularly inflationary. And I think this is interesting if you think about the pandemic era fiscal stimulus, because it occurred precisely in the context of uh, unbalanced expenditure pattern and probably also contributed to uh, this unbalance itself. All right, so last part of the paper. So, so far, I assume that technological constraints are exogenous. What if firms can invest in order to relax uh, their uh, supply constraint? So first, why do I think this is an interesting uh, uh, extension? Well, because a recent paper by Ethan Itzeski uh, documents a very interesting fact from World War II. So Ethan looks at the public purchases by the US government of military airplanes, and he shows that uh, these purchases, since they were very sudden and very large, push uh, uh, aircraft manufacturers against supply constraint. So aircraft producing firms had a very hard time at first in satisfying uh, uh, these government purchases. But these aircraft manufacturers reacted to this high demand by investing in order to upgrade the technologies and increase their productive capacity over the medium run. So it looks like this high demand shock shaped uh, the supply constraints uh, over the medium run. Of course, you know, this evidence refers to a very specific event, but the notion that firms will adapt to high demand by investing to relax their supply constraints seems quite natural, so I want to think about the implication of that through this model. To do so, let me assume that firms can invest to relax their future supply constraint. So they can invest to change their future Y bar. Firms choose uh, investment to maximize profits, so they look uh, at the impact of investment on the whole stream of profits. What's interesting here is that even though we are in a perfectly competitive economy, firms make profits when the supply constraint bind. Why? Because when the supply constraint bind, prices rise above wages, and the profit that they make are proportional to the supply constraint. Firms have an incentive to invest when they perceive that they will be against their supply constraints in the future. In this simple model, uh, optimal investment takes uh, a straightforward form. So if the marginal cost of investing is higher than the marginal benefit, firms will not invest. Um, instead, they will invest up to the point in which the marginal cost of increasing their future productive capacity is equal to uh, the marginal benefit. To make things interesting, here it makes sense to think about a persistent fiscal stimulus. So let me think about an increase in government expenditure that lasts for a few periods. Now, you can find the mathematical derivation in the paper. Let me just give you the intuition of what will happen. So what will happen is that if the fiscal stimulus is sufficiently high, if GH is sufficiently high, it will generate an investment boom in the short run, in period zero. Why? Because firms perceive that if they don't invest, they will be against their supply constraint for a large amount of time, and that will reduce their profit. In turn, this investment boom in the short run will increase productive capacity and relax supply constraint over the medium run. 
To show you the implication about uh, on it for inflation, let me again draw on this diagram. Now, we need to differentiate between the short-run Phillips curve and the medium-run Phillips curve. So the short-run Phillips curve is given by the red line. So initially, in the short run, the fiscal stimulus has a large impact on the inflation rate. Why? Because in the short run, firms cannot adjust to this increase in demand. So the increase in demand creates high inflationary pressures. Actually, the inflationary pressures are higher than in an economy without investment because the endogenous response of investment to the fiscal stimulus amplify the rise in aggregate demand due to the stimulus itself. But then, you know, in the medium run, investment relaxes supply constraint and it generates a rightward shift, positive shift of uh, the steep portion of the Phillips curve. So in the medium run, from period one on, the economy jumps on the new Phillips curve and this tends to generate lower inflation. Why? Because, you know, higher productive capacity means higher productivity, and this allows firm to uh, reduce prices and reduce their inflation rate. So once you think about investment, you see that there is a sort of an intertemporal inflation trade-off. So investment tends to exacerbate the inflation produced by fiscal stimulus in the short run, but it tends to mitigate it in the medium run because it allows the economy to become more productive, reducing marginal cost and inflation over uh, the medium run. All right, let me wrap up uh, with a bit of self-promotion. So I think that uh, you know, supply constraints are potentially important for firms pricing behavior and inflation. And in fact, I have two papers that uh, develop this insight. First, I have some work with Federica Romei. There we think about the impact of supply constraint for the international transmission of inflation, especially during the pandemic. And I also have some recent work with Veronica Guerrieri and Lucrezia Reichlin, where instead we argue that supply constraint might be important to understand the consequences for inflation and monetary policy of the energy transition, the transition toward a greener economy, because we expect that during the transition, supply constraint will become particularly important for dirty sectors. More generally, you know, I hope that uh, this presentation convinced you that uh, uh, supply constraints are an interesting uh, uh, avenue to make progress in understanding inflation dynamics. And, you know, it's a very new approach. So I think that uh, more new theoretical and empirical work is definitely welcome to understand better the macroeconomic implication of uh, firm supply constraint. And I will uh, stop here. Thank you, Luca. So now I give the floor to Julia Ditti, currently at the ECB. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, First of all, uh, um, good morning. Uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss this very interesting uh, paper. So first of all, uh, let me start by saying that I really enjoyed reading this paper and I learned a lot from it. In my research, uh, I study from an empirical point of view the nonlinearity of the Phillips curve in relationship to the labor market. So I particularly enjoyed uh, learning how Luca has studied the, the nonlinearity of the Phillips curve from a theoretical point of view in relationship to supply constraints. So this paper asks uh, uh, whether and how a fiscal stimulus affects inflation in the context of uh, supply constraints. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, particularly relevant to assess the inflationary effects uh, of the pandemic era U.S. fiscal packages, uh, which amounted to 15% of the U.S. GDP. So this paper answers this question by developing a new theoretical framework uh, with occasionally binding supply constraints. Uh, so the uh, novelty of this framework is, uh, uh, resides in how the production side of the, mo uh, of the production side is modeled. And it is composed of um, a continuum of uh, perfectly competitive firms uh, that produce a final good uh, using labor allocated to two tasks, A and B. The supply constraints are introduced uh, as uh, a technological constraint that limits uh, the amount of labor allocated to task B. So when the constraints are slack, uh, then the marginal cost depends only on the wage rate because labor is the only uh, input to production. And uh, since uh, wages are assumed to be fully rigid, then marginal costs uh, are rigid as well. And so are prices because firms operate under perfect competition. But when uh, constraints uh, are binding, uh, then the marginal costs are increasing in the quantity produced uh, and driving up uh, prices. So um, this implies that the Phillips curve is uh, nonlinear 
uh, there exists a Y bar, which is uh, the um, which is the level of output above which supply constraints become binding, and um, if output is below Y bar, then the then the Phillips curve is constant, uh, is flat because uh, marginal costs uh, are rigid. While uh, above Y bar, the Phillips curve becomes upward sloping because uh, the marginal costs are increasing in quantity. The Phillips curve is uh, not stable, but it reacts to macroeconomic shocks. So, for example, a supply chain disruption uh, um, uh, decreases Y bar and so shifts uh, the kink of the Phillips curve to the left. The second result is that the Phillips curve is also not stable to. Um, so I mean, like in uh, uh, with this uh, uh, with this uh, with this framework in mind, uh, it is uh, straightforward to see how a how a fiscal shock can be inflationary in uh, uh, in this context, uh, because uh, if the fiscal uh, uh, stimulus is able to uh, push the economy to the upward uh, slope part of the Phillips curve. Uh, then uh, it will have an, an effect on inflation. So this will happen when supply constraints uh, bind. And of course, uh, the inflationary effect is going to be more pronounced uh, during supply chain disruption, which shifts uh, the um, upward slope of the Phillips curve to the left. So the Phillips curve is also not stable with respect to the fiscal policy shock itself, uh, because if uh, the fiscal stimulus is targeted on uh, one sector, then uh, the kink of the Phillips curve will shift uh, leftward, and so the fiscal stimulus will have a larger impact on inflation, uh, and uh, more likely so if, uh, um, if we are in a time of sectoral reallocation of uh, consumption expenditure, because these reallocations shift up uh, the Phillips curve, as you can see on the right. And uh, finally, the um, any, a, a persistent fiscal stimulus uh, can create an intertemporal trade-off if, if it leads firms to invest uh, to overcome uh, their supply constraints. So in the short run, uh, such investments will amplify the inflationary pressures, uh, while in the medium run, by allowing firms uh, to um, to relax their supply constraints, uh, they will uh, shift the kink of the Phillips curve to the right. And so in the medium run, we will have uh, uh, lower inflation. So now let me tell you uh, what in my views are the two main contributions of this paper. So uh, there is a growing literature that studies the nonlinearity of the Phillips curve. And this literature has identified different sources uh, for this nonlinearity. So, for example, there is the presence of a quasi king demand curve, the presence of wage rigidities combined with labor shortages, uh, large shocks uh, with state dependent pricing, and of course, supply constraints. Uh, and uh, this paper fits in this uh, fourth category. And it contributes to it by microfounding a nonlinear Phillips curve uh, that is, it is consistent uh, with the micro level empirical evidences that we have on uh, the uh, firm's uh, pricing decisions under supply constraints. The second, uh, secondly, there is mixed evidence uh, on the inflationary effects of the pandemic era you ask uh, fiscal packages, uh, because there are some paper that uh, um, show that the fiscal stimulus uh, significantly contributed to the inflation surge of 2021 and 2022. However, Comin and co-authors, uh, they show that the fiscal stimulus prevented deflation in 2020. So indeed, the fiscal stimulus had an inflationary effect, uh, but did not drive uh, the inflation surge uh, that uh, followed. So this paper outlines uh, a, a new uh, channel uh, through which uh, the fiscal stimulus can have an impact on inflation through supply constraints uh, instead of wages. So I think it will be interesting for future research to include this channel in a more quantitative model to understand uh, the uh, contribution of this channel to the inflation surge and contribute to this debate. So now let me turn to my uh, comments. I have two comments and one question. So first of all, uh, um, so in order to allow the fiscal stimulus to have an impact on inflation that goes uh, that doesn't go through wages, uh, um, the author assumes that uh, wages are fully rigid, uh, and so labor supply is determined by labor demand. However, in the post-COVID period, the post-COVID period was characterized by severe labor shortages in the U.S. Uh, and indeed, the U.S. labor market was the tightest since World War II. 
and uh, this high level of tightness was driven by a decline in desired uh, hours worked. So I think it would be useful to, um, to discuss uh, the implications of allowing uh, labor supply shocks uh, uh, within the model. Uh, because maybe they could have a nonlinear effect uh, depending on whether the uh, supply constraints are binding or not. Uh, but also I think uh, they might be relevant for uh, the transmission of inflation. Uh, so in the setup with the multi-sectoral economy uh, in which there is a manufacturing and service sector. Because uh, in this uh, uh, so uh, setup, uh, um, Manufacturing firms uh, are pushed uh, to their uh, supply against their supply constraints uh, with a fiscal stimulus. But then you need more fiscal stimulus in order to push also service firms uh, against their supply constraints in order to have uh, inflation also there. Uh, however, I think that uh, um, allowing for labor supply shocks and so uh, these could help in the reinforcement of the transmission mechanism from uh, the manufacturing to the service uh, sector, given that the service sector is, uh, um, is, uh, uh, labor, uh, is labor intensive and there is ample evidence that uh, uh, it was hard to find workers. So uh, the second assumption that is made is that um, monetary policy keeps the uh, real interest rate constant at its steady state value and uh, uh, so consumption is fixed and does not react uh, to the fiscal stimulus and uh, uh, this assumption is crucial in order to isolate uh, the effect of a fiscal stimulus uh, uh, how a fiscal stimulus affects the relationship between output and inflation uh, however, uh, there is evidence that uh, uh, the loose monetary policy, a loose monetary policy stance significantly contributed to the inflation surge. And so here you can see a figure from Cohen and co-authors where uh, you can see the interaction between fiscal policy and capacity constraints in the goods sector indeed were inflationary in 2020. But then it was the interaction between uh, monetary policy and the capacity constraints in the goods sector that drove inflation uh, in 2021-2022. So I think that it would be interesting to discuss uh, um, the implications of relaxing this assumption and especially the interaction between a loose monetary policy and the fiscal stimulus. Finally, I uh, found that the medium term implications of the fiscal stimulus are very interesting. And again, these implications are that if firms invest in more efficient uh, technologies, then the Phillips curve will shift uh, to the right. So I went to the data and I, uh, and I looked uh, whether uh, firms are making like this investment. So as you can see from the graph, uh, um, there is evidence that firms uh, uh, almost doubled uh, their in manufacturing firms uh, almost doubled their investment in uh, structures, uh, signaling uh, a, an effort uh, at expanding uh, their production capacity. However, the investment in R&D was uh, uh, growing since uh, after the Great Recession, and it picked up uh, the trend after, uh, after COVID with the slow uh, growth uh, in recent periods. So I, I wonder whether like these type of investments will be enough to uh, push uh, uh, the, the supply constraints uh, uh, of firms uh, and uh, uh, achieve uh, a, a benign shift of the Phillips curve uh, in the medium run. So to conclude, uh, again, I greatly enjoy reading this paper. I especially appreciated the setup of this uh, analytical framework in line with empirical evidence. I think that Luca uh, made uh, um, a great job in outlining the main mechanism in a very simple and clear way. And I think the uh, paper could benefit from discussing the implications of relaxing some strong assumptions. And finally, I think that this has uh, very important implications for policy and uh, uh, future research. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's move to the second paper by uh, Bei Kui from University College London on taxing sudden capital income surges. Sorry. Can you hear me? Great. Um, thanks very much for having me on the program. Uh, and this is a paper joined with Jenjun Miao from Boston University. Uh, we're interested in actually uh, progressive capital taxation. Okay, so the big background, if you think about uh, recently, talking about, you know, wealth tax versus uh, capital tax. I think capital income tax is gradually losing ground, 
uh, I, I mentioned the literature later on because you know maybe there's capital inflow and outflow, um, and, and also if uh, uh, wealth are related to different rate of returns when you're accumulating wealth. Um, but we're going to show that if there are capital income jumps coming from, um, um, uh, sorry, it's not working. Oh, okay. Doesn't seem to, apology. Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so, so if we think about um, the wealth inequality recently and what happened to the right tail, then uh, there is a ground for actually arguing for um, progressive capital taxation. It will be um, um, on, on the circumstances better than wealth taxation. Of course, in my model, in the end, the wealth tax is the same as a flat rate capital taxation. Suppose we tax 20% of all kinds of capital income that will be the same as taxing wealth. Um, there are some um, differences in the literature, uh, but we're going to argue that uh, looking at the um, sudden jumps and think about progressive capital income uh, tax will be very uh, um, efficient, not only about the distribution in the end. So let's think about new fortunes. So we were motivated by recent um, uh, kind of uh, studies. For example, this one, if you study Norwegian administrative data, looking at the top 0.1%, okay? So who are these guys? At least a quarter of them started with debt. And during their life cycle, immediately jumped uh, to, to top 0.1%. And looking at F Forbes magazines, um, if you look at the 100 richest Americans, uh, also compared to 1970s, a lot of them actually get their wealth from, from new companies, new ideas. So this uh, uh, suggests that new fortunes, so sudden capital income jumps, could be very important for, for the top wealth shares. And what we do in this paper is to um, write down an analytical tractable model, you don't need a computer at all, to, to solve everything in closed form. And looking at the tail uh, of the wells uh, coming from capital income jumps, and study, uh, obviously, aggregate outcomes. And when you tax capital, and we look at uh, flat rate capital taxation as well as progressive capital taxation, progressive capital taxation here really means that you target those jump incomes, um, and uh, we, we look at uh, uh, whether they are efficient or not. So a couple of highlights here. Um, we introduce these things for capital income jumps. That is based on our previous work. We find hyper-exponential distribution for the jump size to be quite um, useful. What is hyper-exponential distribution? So it's a mix of exponential distribution. In our analysis, we only need two. So you have a normal jump and a really good jump. Think about good ideas. Sometimes it's fantastic. Sometimes it's OK. All right. And we uh, uh, turns out we find this to be crucial to generate very realistic wealth right tail, the top 1% and top 0.1%. And it's especially important to um, overturn a result in standard incomplete market model. So we heard about many Iagari, Billy type of model. One uh, potential problem of that model is the input uh, distribution, like the labor income distribution, versus the wealth distribution. If you compare these two, the income distribution got to have a, a thicker wealth, a thicker tail or fatter tail than the wealth distribution, thanks to precautionary savings. Okay, you have an input distribution and you have precautionary savings. Think about the squeezing of the distribution in the end. But the data is the opposite. The, the um, top 0.1% holds about 15% of the wealth. But if you look at the top 0.1% of income, they probably only have uh, 7 or 8%. Although it is very high, but the tail comparison suggests the opposite uh, compared to the data. Once we have the income jumps, um, actually we can reverse that relationship, suggesting that this potential mechanism could be very useful to capture the the wealth dynamics. And finally, if we do that, then we have a lot to say about progressive capital uh, income tax. What we found, this is probably surprising, actually taxing the jump income, obviously, is good for redistribution, right? You, you target those uh, high income one, but it could be also more efficient 
if you th think about uh, a flat rate capital tax similar to wealth tax, that means this is going to be better than wealth tax, okay? And, and also it can uh, reduce inequality for obvious reasons, but we show that it needs to uh, couple with um, um, some redistribution policy. So if we place things in the literature, this is something I really want to emphasize. Uh, to generate very fat tail wealth distribution using incomplete market model, there, there's a strand of literature, I guess, uh, from uh, uh, Jess, um, a course of my previous paper, uh, and Fatih as well, uh, and the courses. Um, it's about the heterogeneous returns of assets, okay, which is not following jumps. Um, but the, the issue there is, well, they're going to argue wealth tax might be more efficient because if heterogeneous returns are related to heterogeneous productivity, and if you have capital tax, then you are taxing more productive guys, right? And that's bad for capital accumulation and so on. So this is why I mentioned wealth tax, or sorry, the other way around, capital income tax is gradually losing ground recently. But if we look at uh, potential jumps, not just heterogeneous returns, then progressive uh, capital uh, tax can be very useful. And why is that? Well, that is related to another uh, labor income literature, um, progressive uh, labor income tax. There, they don't find uh, a lot of room for progressive capital income, but they find uh, a lot of uh, progressivity for labor income. And it's really useful to tax extreme high income, labor income, because the idea behind is uh, they have very high labor income, but a warm, sometimes they call that awesome state for those who work in this uh, area. If you tax those uh, very high uh, sudden income, um, the incentives of supplying labor is not distorted very much. The reason is uh, they would not always have awesome state. So it's just uh, 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 once perhaps over over 10 or 20 years, and taxing that won't have a big distortion. The same can be said for our um, taxing um, sudden capital income surge. It is rare, it is sudden, and if you tax that, it is gonna be uh, less distortionary compared to, to flat rate income tax, which is the same as wealth tax. Okay, in the interest of time, let me jump to the, to the model. Um, I will probably bother you a little bit with, with the continuous time mass, but I, 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 I will skip a lot of details just to emphasize the, the big picture. So uh, we have a continuum of um, households, and for simplicity, the aggregate units of labors are constants, but each household will receive idiosyncratic shocks, so you have a heterogeneity over there, and then you have heterogeneity in labor income. Um, each household owns and runs a private firm. Um, this can be thought of uh, investing um, corporate firms, but they have uh, segmented markets. Um, those firms employ laborers, but they can only use capital stock invested by a particular household, so you have segmented markets uh, uh, in this sense. And there will be only two sources of uh, shocks. One is the labor income shock, the other is a uh, um, shock to, to the um, capital, and that will be modeled as a, as a sudden jump. Okay, and in the in the market, there's only riskless private government bonds, and you cannot fully diversify away the shocks. Uh, government bonds are more liquid than than capital, um, and that's basically a two asset um, incomplete market model. We focus on the stationary economy, just to simplify the analysis. So this is why I mentioned there's a little bit complication on the continuous time modeling, but um, idea is very similar to discrete time. Um, here, let's say um, we have a delta T, very small increment there, and we have uh, ups and zin type of utility, and why do we need that? This is because in the end, we want the model to match a marginal propensity to consume, as in the data. So F is the time aggregator, while this uh, curly R, is the um, certainty equivalence. The, the trick to have analytical solution is to have CARA, constant absolute risk aversion parameter here, but CRRA to prevent consumption to drop to uh, 
negative. And combining these two, you can um, basically go back to finance literature, this optimal portfolio choice coming at least from Merton's model, you can have a, a um, closed form solution for capital and bonds. So, okay, uh, this psi measures the elasticity of intertemporal substitution that is crucial for MPC. Um, for the household, they also um, open firms, which are tax flat rate at tau k. So that will be the uh, flat rate capital tax or wealth tax, which will have some equivalents out there. Um, they will uh, operate under some constant return to scale technology using capital and labor. W is the wage and tau l is the uh, labor income tax. And then turns out to be a linear uh, profit function. That is standard. Um, what is not so standard is the labor income process. I want to advertise this process a little bit. We used in the previous study. Um, there are only three parameters. Okay, so this is basically uh, a modified um, AR1 process. In finance, it's called the Cox Ingersoll Ross interest rate process. Basically, the, the new thing is there's a square root of L in front of the Brownian motion. Okay, that means the labor income cannot be negative. And the reason used in finance is you don't want interest rate to fall below some uh, lower bound. Here would be zero. Uh, only three parameters, okay, only three. It turns out it can match the census data pretty well. Um, uh, only three. Of course, our model is stylized, but if you go to the literature, um, uh, what I know is at least you need six or even 26, I think, uh, given is a recent paper to match um, the, the uh, census data. It turns out this is, is really useful. I'm going to show you a simulation later on. Um, of course, we lost some of the aspects, but for our analysis, this is, is, is enough. Okay, that is the first shock. The second shock is the jump. Okay, um, uh, the entrepreneurial profits coming from capital, and they have some um, uh, uh, adjustments costs so that we can determine the capital uniquely. There's quadratic adjustments cost, and it follows a jump. The jump size is random. So if you have a jump, that size is also random. This is kind of a compound jump uh, uh, Poisson process. Um, and uh, the jump size follows a hyper exponential distribution. What is a hyper exponential distribution? So this is the, the fun part, okay? The red one, oh, sorry, the, bl uh, the blue one is the HED, and it's a mix of two exponential distribution. I'm plotting the uh, PDF. So uh, one distribution is captured by uh, the mean mu j, and you only need one parameter for each exponential distribution, right? And this mu j is after tax um, average return of the components. So we have a flat rate tax as well as the progressive tax part. And then as you can see, um, the first component is very close to the HED, while the second component is way off, okay? So, so basically to capture the very right tail, you really need the second component, but the first component um, is, uh, oh, sorry, the, bl uh, the blue one is, uh, over normal range of capital incomes is very close to the first. So most of the time, the first is enough to capture the wealth distribution, but to get the really, really right tail, this uh, uh, second component is, is crucial. And this second component is very crucial for capital tax as well. Without this, the, the conclusion is gonna be uh, different. Okay, uh, and then finally, budget constraint combining all of them together, defining X as the wealth uh, coming from capital and bonds. Then you have rate of return from bonds, profits, labor income, consumption, some government um, transfers. And, and then after uh, putting everything, you, you have a standard budget constraint. Here we don't have borrowing limits, okay? Uh, but you have uh, still incomplete markets because there's only one asset to save. So let me jump to the, well, we write down the, uh, the Bellman equation. Let me jump to the the results. So this is the consumption. Consumption under the Kara utility with Epsilon Zing type of uh, adjustments will be proportional to wealth. This is the capital and bonds, as well as your labor income part. That's the human wealth and some precautionary saving terms. All right, and this will be uh, marginal propensity to consume. And what is that? 
this is the difference between your subject discount factor and interest rate times the EIS. So it, elasticity of intertemporal substitution controls the MPC. Um, and then capital investment that has the access return and the jump pot. And that, in the end, will illustrate why um, capital income tax, flat rate tax, that affects R, RK, these are after-tax return, will be so different from taxing the, the jump pot. Because the jump pot doesn't affect RK, but if you tax the jump pot, it only affects the denominator here. And it uh, happens with a very small probability. So in the end, the distortion here will be very small on investments. But if you tax the flat rate, if you change tau k, right, then you change RK immediately, the MPK immediately. That distorts investment to a great deal. Okay, um, let me skip this one. Uh, basically illustrating um, the um, idea behind MPC as well as uh, precautionary savings. Um, then we define stationary equilibrium. Um, so we focus on stationary equilibrium with tau k, tau l, tau j. I'm gonna vary tau k and tau j as a comparison. Fixing G, okay, government spending will be fixed. B will be a um, policy that the government may or may not choose to, to vary. Uh, we had in the first session about liquidity. This is, uh, this is also a liquidity policy. Yeah, for those of you who know my research a little bit, uh, yeah, I'm addicted to liquidity. All my paper has at least liquidity to some extent. Although this is a fiscal paper, but liquidity plays an important role. Okay, so then uh, optimality and markets clear, and finally um, the government budget constraint. So I want to spend 30 seconds on government budget constraint. As you can see, there are tau k, the flat rate capital tax, as well as tau j. And then I'm gonna vary tau k and tau j, obviously uh, satisfying the government budget constraint, but tau j part is inside besides the tau k, so it introduces an extra, extra layer there. Um, and I'll come back to the efficiency of tau j. Okay, um, then that's the model. Let me show you the equilibrium. Um, I advertised in the beginning that uh, everything is in closed form. This is the, the thing. You can solve the equilibrium without knowing the distribution. So basically there are sets of parameters both controlling the aggregate as well as the distribution. Okay, those parameters including EIS, beta, um, and other labor supply stuff. And in the end, the distribution can be uh, looked at this, uh, this equation. That's the wealth dynamics. And you can use the common log of a four-way equation to solve the distribution. I'm gonna simulate it. And the jump part plays a very important role for the wealth. Then, that, that is the interesting thing. Once we have um, the analytical solution, I can compare the relative variance of wealth and labor, relative skewness of wealth and labor, and relative kurtosis of wealth and labor. All right? Um, you might ask me, wait a minute, we know that wealth distribution follow a Pareto with, with, a, with a parameter less than two. We cannot have skewness and kurtosis. So that's true for the theory um, purpose, but you know, um, in the end, we can fit the wealth with this um, uh, type of model that um, actually wealth it has an exponential tail. So the idea behind it is we, we will stop in the data at some point. The, the Pareto will continue the wealth to infinity, wealth to infinity, right? But we don't have to because the data stops somewhere. Uh, in the end, this uh, uh, exponential tail is very good enough to capture um, the wealth in the data. Um, and if that's the case, we can compute skewnesses and kurtosis. So the uh, wealth skewnesses and kurtosis are very large. The key idea is the following. If you shut down lambda k, the jump, then, and if you trust me, this is a number that is smaller than one, which means that your output distribution has a lighter tail than your input distribution. This is the input, your, your income. This is the output. But adding the lambda k, does not necessarily generate the opposite result because lambda k is a risk as well. You still have precautionary savings. So it appears in the bottom, that's uh, minus uh, three divided by two. So that part can further push down the, the tail of the wealth, but it has this part, 
that push up the, the wealth tail relative to, to the labor income. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, you need um, just enough illiquidity to, to prevent the precautionary savings to some extent, and you generate a, a thicker tail of the wealth, which is the, the third term, which is the third term. And if you really want to analyze the tail behaviors of the wealth and labor, it can capture by this comparison. These are the uh, exponential decay rates. We proved that the wealth and labor follow exponential distribution in the end because it's a mixed exponential uh, as an input. And this alpha x is the wealth tail decay rate, which is affected by taxes. And uh, this is by labor. And we can see that the second component of the jump will change this uh, decay rate to a large extent. And the wealth tail can decay much, much slower than, than the labor income. So uh, these are the theory uh, parts. Let me show you the quantitative part and then look at the um, progressive tax versus uh, income tax, uh, sorry, the flat rate tax. So first we calibrate the model um, especially these two to jump a uh, mean, okay? There are two exponentials. So you have an exponential that works very normal. The mean is 10%, uh, but there's another one that is like 600% before tax. And then we estimate the labor income process. Um, I um, said that it matched the data pretty well. Let me show you the picture here. This is the um, data from the census study by Guvenen and, and all. Uh, the causes. This is the model. We look at one-year log income changes. So looking at the gross rate of your income and then five years um, compared to, to the normal distribution. Um, basically, the, the um, log changes have uh, uh, quite large kurtosis, not much skewness, and fits the data reasonably well. And finally, this was the um, thing about the tail. So if we look at the uh, U.S. wealth data, then you, you look at the power distribution, the, um, the Pareto distribution, roughly speaking is about 1.55 to 1.6, depending on the era. And then if we plot the log of wealth and log of counter CDF, that would be the Pareto. And this will be our model, okay, the, the, the blue line. So it's a mix of all the exponential distribution and the second part capture this uh, decline uh, to, to a large extent and you stop here. So then, you forget about all the further declining, and you can still match to top 0.1%, top 0.01%, depending on uh, what you need. Um, and, and this is the whole wealth distribution, the, the model, and the, uh, the data. This is from the distributional account. I, I, I just learned this morning that ECB is gonna publish uh, similar things. That's from the Fed. Um, and, and yeah, we basically match the top 0.1%, which is really hard thing to, ma to, to, to match if you uh, have done similar studies. Top 1% and the rest uh, also reasonably good. Then let's look at policy. I'm going to look at uh, two tax policy and two distributional policy. First is to just uh, increase capital tax, flat rate capital tax, that's tau K. Second, progressive tax, just uh, raise tau J. And then look at the two types of spending policy. If you get a tax revenue, what are you going to spend? First, lump sum redistribute, or you use the, the, um, the revenue to increase government bonds because you have more resources, you can raise more debt. Why do you want to do that? This is the incomplete market model. Uh, one can supply more government debt and give more assets for uh, precautionary savings. And in our model, recall that there's no borrowing constraint. There is actually an aggregate version of recording equivalence. Okay, if, if you uh, um, change B and, and, uh, and lump sum tax, there's a recording equivalence because um, no borrowing constraint. So aggregate effects will be the same, but the redistribution will uh, depend on what type of policy used. Um, here's what we do if we um, tax a lot more, then savings curve will, will go down, okay? The red is uh, the original calibrated equilibrium, and then you tax more, then savings curve will go down, um, as well as the demand curve for capital. That, that's a standard curve in um, demand and supply for capital in that Gary type of model. So what it means is uh, interest rate in our calibrated version, 
will go up and capital will fall. So if you tax more, people will um, invest less, obviously. And lower K, lower capital, means a higher marginal part of capital and, and higher rate. Um, but if we look at variance, skewnesses, and kurtosis, then if you vary the tax rate, um, that does not generate very monotone effect. So tax itself can increase the relative skewness of wealth to labor income. Kurtosis, if you continue, it will eventually come down. So this is the theory results because kurtosis and skewnesses do not uh, need to be simulated. Um, but the details, uh, we need to simulate everything because we, when we look at top 0.1%, top 1%, um, it's uh, more than the skewness and kurtosis. The first thing is um, um, looking at the efficiency, if we simulate. Um, here, if we increase the tax rate, either tau k or tau j, let's compare the output loss. That would be our, my, my key message of using progressive capital income tax. Progressive tax actually has a lower efficiency loss than flat rate tax. So if you increase the same, uh, not the same uh, rate, but getting the same tax revenue compared to the benchmark, which one is better? The progressive tax is much better. And the reason, again, goes back to, to the efficiency discussion in the mes investment equation. Think about the idea behind, you get 600% rail returns and you are taxed to 20 percent which is 400 percent it's still 400 percent it's good anyway why don't you invest as before right 400 percent is still very good uh, to return and if you ask me oh maybe people will uh, invest in uh, some islands but those islands do not provide infrastructures uh, similar good outcomes as this 400 percent that's why um, investment is very, very insensitive to change of uh, the, the progressive tax. What if you change the tau k, then the output loss is much higher. Because flat rate on everything. Last two slides. One is uh, how do you distribute? First is um, the benchmark, okay, lump sum tax. And then we use lump sum transfer of um, the tax revenue. Either you increase tau k or tau j. Turns out that uh, it gets you worse inequality because the bottom, the bottom has less wealth shares. And the reason is if you do lump sum transfers, you provide better insurance to everyone, then those uh, uh, people will borrow more, especially in the bottom. So then they hold less wealth. So the wealth inequality goes up. Final slide is suppose you use the tax to uh, increase government bonds and you have the ability to do so because you have more uh, income, then providing um, Government bonds actually helps to, to uh, get the inequality measures to go, go down. So poor people hold more um, as well as uh, uh, lower Gini index and the top uh, wealth shares go down. So in the end, the prescription is um, combining progressive capital income tax, using the revenues to redistribute uh, via the financial market, providing more safe assets. Um, and, and let me conclude. So hopefully this is a tractable macro framework that uh, obviously heavily relied on exponential tail, the uh, HED, hypo exponential distribution, but it is really useful for analytical purpose and fit at least top 0.1% uh, very well. So the key takeaways, I will say two things. One is uh, this will help me to generate a thicker wealth tail. Without that, it's, it's not possible. So you need the illiquidity of capital and the HED. Second, um, taxing the jump income, which is a progressive capital income tax, might be a good idea if the redistribution is done carefully, which is different from uh, taxing the wealth. Thank you very much, Vai. So let's go to the discussion. That's Johannes Bohm from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Please. Okay, um, so thanks to the organizers for inviting me to discuss this fascinating paper. Very elegant model and very thought-provoking policy analysis. So let me, on the first slide, try to summarize the paper and hint at what I will discuss later. So the model is continuous time heterogeneous agent model with recursive utility. 
and constant absolute risk aversion. And there are these idiosyncratic shocks to capital income, that's called capital surges, capital jumps, and they are hyper exponentially distributed. And then there's a flat tax on capital plus an extra tax on these capital surges. So the great thing is the analytical tractability. And one thing I'll talk or ask about is the implementation of this extra tax. Then turning to the calibration, they get a realistic cross-sectional wealth distribution and a large return premium on private capital. About the second, I could talk a lot, um, but I don't. So let me focus on the first. Um, and in particular, I'll ask about how the mechanism of how the wealthy accumulate wealth, how that matches or um, is in line or not with panel evidence. And then the third part, of course, the policy results. First one is progressive tax distorts investment less than the flat tax. And the second, capital taxation lowers wealth inequality if used to provide liquidity through government debt, but it raises wealth inequality if revenues are distributed equally. Here, I'll mainly focus on the modeling of the investment choice, and I'll ask about consumption inequality um, in addition to wealth inequality. So let's um, start with the question of how these agents accumulate their wealth in this economy. And so as the model is so nice and tractable, I just simulated a bunch of agents um, in this economy. So on the left-hand side, you see their wealth on a linear scale. On the right-hand side, um, you have them on a log scale so that you can also see some of these poor guys down there. And you also already see that there's two guys who received this second exponential shock. So they drew this, what I will call lottery ticket later. Um, so there's this red and the orange, and they got really rich. They got this capital surge. Um, and for what I'll tell you on the next slide, I think most important thing to notice here is that these guys weren't rich before. They weren't actually different at all from the other guys before. And also, if you look at what happens to them afterwards, like after 10 or 20 years, they're basically back to where the others are. So they deaccumulate their wealth pretty fast. So let's think about the dynamics of wealth accumulation. And let me contrast the nice tractable model with its analytical features with some empirical evidence. So the model has a constant MPC out of total wealth, so out of financial wealth plus future labor income plus future transfers coming from the homothetic preferences. And it has an equity share that is not rising, not constant, but falling in wealth. And that's natural consequence of the constant absolute risk aversion utility. And of course, there's empirical evidence um, to the contrary. So this paper um, by Hapmer et al. that you um, already cited and of course, there's lots of evidence in, say, in there. So it's a great new paper. So have a look at that. So some evidence is in favor of, of your story. Some is not. So I pick kind of the critical parts. So what they do is kind of they try to account for how the top 0.1% accumulate their excess wealth. And by this accounting exercise, they find that to a large extent, they do so by savings rates, so higher savings rates and inheritances to some extent through returns, higher returns, and to a little extent through higher labor income. And the second feature is that they have a much higher equity share than the rest. Like the median household has most of its wealth in housing, and the very rich have more than 80% in equity, mainly private equity. So with these um, observations, I would just like to um, urge the authors to be more upfront about the fact that the model really emphasizes, maybe overemphasizes, but that's fine, the role of new fortunes from investment. In the talk, you, you did that a lot already. Um, and also to, to admit that it does not capture the potentially heterogeneous savings rates that might play an additional important role there. So let me move to the results. First one was that additional capital tax uh, sorry, additional capital surge tax distorts investment less than higher flat tax. So why is that in the model? 
Um, I think it's mainly because innovation results from saving in private capital in some sense as a byproduct. So like a lottery ticket that you get in addition to doing your business as usual. And this byproduct is ex ante available equally to everyone and it's ex post delivered delivering these rare huge returns. And as Y explained nicely, well, if this return is a little less huge by this extra tax, then of course it won't change your decision much. But let me raise this concern that maybe the capital tax surge might impact incentives differently if there was a separate innovation or R&D choice that you could make like separately from your capital investment in your private um, business. And then if agents were heterogeneous with respect to their innovative productivity, then you could also overturn this result, like in the Gouvernant paper that you also mentioned, where you would find that the capital income tax is actually not as good, uh, sorry, is actually better than um, the wealth tax. Um, okay, so let's move to the second result which was that capital taxation reduces wealth inequality if used for liquidity provision, but raises wealth inequality if revenues are distributed equally. Why is that? Of course, there's many things going on in the general equilibrium setup here, but I think the main mechanism is pretty simple, that if you redistribute the revenue, reduce precautionary savings from the poor, and from that they save less, so inequality in wealth is higher. Um, but so what? maybe consumption inequality is lower. And that's why I would just want to encourage you to look at the distribution of consumption. And maybe you can derive the distribution of consumption um, analytically as you do for the distribution of wealth. That would be a great additional value of the paper in terms of theory and um, the application. So finally, I want to talk about the implementation of this tax. So this, it's an accrual-based extra tax on capital income jumps, as you have it in the paper taken literally. And of course, one could first ask, like, how do you exactly identify the jumps? Um, but they are large, they are rapid, maybe it's easy to identify them, but they are not literal jumps as in the paper, and that brings up an additional problem that, like, Taxing them right away might hinder innovation in some sense, might throw some sand in the wheels. So that's one question that you might want to discuss. And then the other thing is if the value of these assets varies, so if there are asset price fluctuations, then a recent paper by Aguiar, Moll, and Scheuer, they show that then you might want to have a capital tax that is based on realization and not on accrual as in this paper. So that's also something that I would like to encourage you to discuss in the paper and maybe um, see how this would change things. So let me conclude with that. Um, so I think the paper really elegantly makes the point that taxing capital income jumps to fund the government debt can achieve a good balance between efficiency and redistribution. That's your words, and I totally agree. So that's the paper making really elegantly this point. And I think it's certainly true if capital surges can be thought of as stemming from lottery tickets that are attached to ordinary private capital investment. And to some extent, I think one can think of them like that, but not totally. So sensitivity within this model and richer ones and also empirical work to see how important this mechanism is, is really in place. 